بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and we are approximately two weeks away from the holy month of Ramadan. And so at this time, it is very important that we refresh our knowledge in order for our mind and our soul and our heart and our body to be prepared for this blessed month of Ramadan. My brothers and sisters in Islam, there is a hadith that Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiyallahu anhu narrated. And he said, أَنَّ رَجُلَيْنِ مِنْ بَلِي قَدِمَا عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَكَانَ إِسْلَامَهُمَا جَمِيعًا Talha ibn Ubaidillah رضي الله عنه He says that were two men from the town of Bali The town of Bali is a town close to Al-Madina قَدِمَا عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ They both approached the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم at the same time And they were two Jews and they embraced Islam and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah Now these two have accepted Islam at the same time. One of them had more effort in Islam than the other. So his effort were to the point that he joined one of the battles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and qadarullah that he passed away as a shaheed. He earned a shahada fi sabilillah, so he was martyred. His friend that accepted Islam at the same time lived to witness another ye, a full ye. And after one ye, he died. Natural causes on his deathbed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his soul. Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu, after these two have died, one night he was sleeping, he had a dream. In his dream, he saw himself and these two people, these two companions, standing outside the door of the paradise and an angel comes and he calls the one who died one year later you know the one who just died on his bed natural death he was called into the paradise first Talha ibn Ubaidillah is there he can see this in the dream so he was called in and admitted to the paradise first and then the angel came out and he called the one who was martyred fi sabilillah and he was admitted into the paradise second and then the angel came and he said to Talha ibn Ubaidillah, you go back. It's not your time yet because he was still alive. Then he woke up from his dream and he was amazed. So he went around al Madina informing the people what he saw and the people were amazed with him as well. What is surprising in the hadith that how could this person who died naturally enter the paradise first before a shaheed fi sabilillah? And now we all know what special gifts Allah Azza wa Jal gives, gives a shaheed. How can this person who died on his bed naturally enter the paradise before a shaheed? And so some people would think, you know, what's the big deal? At, at the end of the day, they both entered the paradise. There's always a big deal about the one who comes first in something. You know, in school, the majority of the class passes the exam, but it's always about who came first so that he gets the medal. Who came first in the race? He gets the medal. The one who's first to buy the new, new product of Apple or Samsung, the, the one who's first to buy the product, he's the one who's interviewed and he's the one who's asked and he's given a special earning and a rank among the people. So there's always something special about coming first in something. So he, this man entered the paradise first. The Sahaba see it as a big deal. So they ended going, going to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they narrated this dream unto him. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the amazement on their face and he said to them, Min What are you surprised? What are you all amazed by? So they said to him, obviously, how did this person enter before a shaheed? For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, Alaysa qad makatha hadha ba'dahu sana? Didn't the one who died naturally live? One more year after Shaheed, they said yes. So then he said, وَأَدْرَكَ Ramadan, فَصَلَّى كَذَا وَكَذَا And didn't he also, during that one year that he lived extra, he witnessed the month of Ramadan and he prayed 
this and this amount of rak'at and sajdat in his life more than the shaheed? They said, yes, ya Rasulullah. فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said, فما بينهما أبعد مما بين السماء والأرض. He said that the distance between him and the shaheed is the distance between the heavens and the earth. That's the kind of rank this man earned in the paradise because he lived one year more than his friend to witness Ramadan and to pray such and such amount of rak'at and sujood for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, hadith sahih and it is Ibn, in Ibn Majah rahimahullah. So the idea is we're learning from this hadith that it is a golden opportunity whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives life for a person to live and to witness yet another Ramadan. And this is an opportunity that you may be elevated ranks with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ أَفْضَلَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ مُؤْمِنٍ يُعَمَّرُ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ يَكْفُرُ تَسْبِيحُهُ وَتَكْبِيرُهُ وَتَحْمِيدُهُ وَتَهْلِيلُهُ And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, there is no one better than a believer who, links, who lives a long life. And this life is full of tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وتحميد وتكبير لا إله إلا الله and his life is full of ذكر and worship to Allah سبحانه وتعالى فإلى is a blessing the hadith is teaching us that it is a blessing to witness another Ramadan in your life we ask Allah عز وجل to give us life to witness Ramadan and to give us the ability and the strength that we worship Him during Ramadan we need to first recognize and acknowledge that this is a blessing from Allah سبحانه وتعالى and that the one who doesn't recognize this as a blessing and take advantage of it as a blessing, Allah Azza wa Jal warns such people and He reprimands them in the Quran. Those who are ungrateful to Allah's blessing, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَنْ يُبَدِّلْ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, whoever exchanges the ni'mah of Allah, whoever exchanges the blessing of Allah, yani when a blessing is given to you, you're supposed to thank it. But there are some people that make from the blessing a reason for their ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal, he says, whoever makes a blessing, a reason for his ingratitude, or it leads him to ingratitude, min ba'di ma ja'at, after it has come to him, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns such people about his severe punishment. In other words, the person is warned. The one who doesn't take advantage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings and the one who does not thank them. And so no doubt, Ramadan is an opportunity and it is a blessing from Allah azza wa jal upon all the servants that are living on earth. And Ramadan is such a huge blessing that even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would express his excitement and happiness and pleasure at its arrival. In the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يبشر أصحابه that النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he used to congratulate his companions on the arrival of Ramadan. وابن رجب رحمه الله he said that this hadith is a proof, it's a clear proof that it is permissible to congratulate one another on the occasion of Ramadan. How did the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to congratulate the Sahaba? How did he used to uh, yani, revive their spirit and their happiness and their excitement for this blessed month? He used to say, كَانَ يَقُولُ He used to say to them, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ He used to say to the people when they gathered, Ramadan has come to you, O people. Now the idea is people know that Ramadan is coming. Yani, no one loses count of the calendar. People know after Sha'ban, Ramadan comes. So why is he telling the people Ramadan has come? You see, this implies his excitement and his happiness. It's like, you know, we know someone important is going to come and give us a lesson. So we say, there, there, he arrived. People can see him. But that's excitement. It expresses excitement. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is happy. And he shares this joyful occasion with the companions. And he says to them, Ramadan is coming. Congratulations. Then he says to them, Shahrun Mubarak. This is a blessed month. Blessed month, it means two things. Number one, blessed, it's something for something to increase. When something is blessed by Allah, meaning its goodness is increased. And so Ramadan is a blessed month because our deeds increase. We fast like we never fast in any other month. We worship Allah like we never worship Allah in any other month. We read Quran like we never read Quran in any other month. Right? And that's required. 
in the month of Ramadan, your Quran and your Salat and everything of the worship needs to increase. That's normal. Because this is a blessed occasion and it is a, a month of barakah. There is a lot of reward to gain in this month when you increase in your rewards, when you increase in your deeds. So he'd say to them, Shahrun Mubarak. And the other meaning of Shahrun Mubarak is a dua from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As though he's saying, Allahumma barik lana fi shahrina. As though he's saying, Oh Allah, bless this month for us. Then he would say, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ صِيَامَهُ Allah Azza wa Jal has written upon you all that you fast this month. He has ordained the fasting of this month. Like how he's exciting, he's, he's, he's reviving the spirit in us sahaba and he's exciting them all for this occasion of Ramadan. And then he continues to say, فِيهِ تُفْتَحُ أَبْوَابُ الْجِنَانِ Within this month, the doors of the paradise are going to open, Allahu Akbar. Yani the barrier, every barrier between us and Allah Azza wa Jal will be open. Literally, the doors of the paradise would be open. Where Al Qadi Ayyad, rahimahullah, he says that the meaning of this hadith could also mean that the opportunity of good will open. With the opportunity of hasanat and an increase in hasanat would open. Fihi tuftahu abwabul jinan, as though Allah Azza wa Jal wants to accept from you. And he wants to admit you into the paradise. If he doesn't want to admit you into the paradise, why would the door of the paradise open? You need to read the messages of Allah correctly. And then he would say to them, الجحيم, And the doors of the hellfire would close. The idea, the idea is it's closed. I don't want to punish my servants. I will close it. Make the majority, make the most of the time in Ramadan. Seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection from the fire. Do the deeds that will save you from the fire. In Ramadan, there are 60 opportunities every day, two opportunities to be freed from the fire. And even the devils are chained. The biggest effect on mankind and the biggest يعني, uh, waswas on mankind and the biggest distraction for mankind, which is a shaytan, is locked up. And he's literally locked up. And the devils are too. There are internal devils within us, and that is Al-Qareen, and there are external devils. These external devils that roam flee really and go around from place to place, they are the ones that are literally locked up. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Sulsilat al-shayateen, al-salasil, meaning they are actually chained up. As for the, in, this, the external devils are locked up. What about the internal devil? What happens to him? Al-Qareen. Al-Qareen, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَيَجْرِ مِنْ إِبْنِ آدَمَ مَجْرَ الدَّمْ That the shaytan, he flows in, one of, in, in one's body like how blood flows in the body. And Al-Qareen, what happens to him during Ramadan is that his effect will dramatically be reduced and his evil whispering would be reduced. He's still there but. You know, how does this make sense? Because when you're fasting, a fasting person only has a strong desire for food and drink. When you're fasting and you're extremely hungry and thirsty, what do you think about? You think about food. And thinking about food is permissible because you're thinking about something permissible. Now imagine someone that has eaten and is fully satisfied. What does he think about? His desire begins to think about al-haram, thinking about evil temptations and desires and so on. So the one who is starved, his shaitan that's inside, and literally when a person is fasting, the, the, the veins inside and the arteries, they dilate, they, they, they come in, they become small. And he's in there, flowing in your body, so it's constricted upon him. And until you're hungry and you're thirsty, you're only thinking of that which is halal. Your desire is that for which is halal. You're far away from thinking about anything haram. And that is the shaytan's evil whispering being reduced in the month of Ramadan. For Allah Azza wa Jal, he removes the biggest distraction from our lives. And this is why you find the people doing good in Ramadan, such goodness that they can never see themselves doing before or after Ramadan. This is the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the believers. And then he would say, فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ And within this blessed month is a night, is a night, خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ Much better than a thousand months. A night, if you were to earn maximum reward in it, it would be better than you worshipping Allah azza wa jal day and night. For a thousand months, Allahu Akbar. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the end of this hadith, he warns the companions and warns the ummah 
of the one who neglects this month and the goodness of this month. He says, Man hurimaha, faqad hurim al khayra kullahu. Whoever is deprived of the goodness of the night of Ramadan, whoever is deprived of the goodness of this, what's the goodness of Laylatul Qadr? Of Laylatul Qadr? What's the goodness? The goodness is that you're forgiven for all your sins. من قام رمض من قام ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. That's the goodness alongside the 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 يعني the opportunity of حسنات that Allah سبحانه وتعالى gives the servant who takes advantage of that night. So whoever's deprived of the goodness of ليلة القدر فقد حرم الخير كله. He's been deprived of all forms of good. See how النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he would excite the Sahaba. He would give them good news about Ramadan and then at the end he'd warn them. Don't be of those who are heedless during Ramadan and neglect the blessings of this month. So lots of excitement at the beginning of this hadith concerning the arrival of Ramadan. And at the end of the hadith, it is terrifying. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warning us, the one who neglects and fails to see the importance and the virtue of this month, he is upon a dangerous path. Why not? He is upon a dangerous path. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in another hadith, once he was ascending the mimbar, and with every footstep he would say, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Well, sahaba are amazed. Why did you? Because Ameen is, is to be said at the end of a dua. We heard no dua, we heard nothing. We just heard him say, Ameen. So after the khutbah, they said, uh, uh, during the khutbah, he explained to them why he had said, Ameen. He said that Jibreel came to me, and he had said to me, Ya Muhammad, من أدرك رمضان فلم يغفر له فأبعده الله فقلت آمين جبريل كيم أن ميد دعاء with رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and he said O Muhammad may the one who witnesses Ramadan and finishes Ramadan and Allah has not forgiven him may such a person be humiliated and shamed and disgraced this is a dua from Allah because Allah Azza wa Jal sent Jibreel to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is a dua from Jibreel when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ameen to it. Even how huge is the matter for a person to neglect and be heedless of this month. So it is very important my brothers and sisters in Islam that we prepare for this month in order to avoid being disgraced before Allah Azza wa Jal. And in order to be successful and to make the most of it and to earn the great gifts that Allah Azza wa Jal has made for this month. The gift of forgiveness and mercy and being freed from the fire, elevated ranks with Allah Azza wa Jal. And the charge of Iman that will give you until the next Ramadan. These are some of the gifts of this blessed month. And my brothers and sisters in Islam, just like anything in life, in order to be successful, you must prepare. Heather, we know this as a general principle for everything in life. In life, if you have an exam and you want success, you need to prepare and you need to study and review your work hours and days and weeks and months before the exam. Otherwise, if you just rock up with your pen to the exam, you know that you will fail. You, you have the feeling that you're going to fail. If you have a meeting, you prepare beforehand. You prepare an agenda, what's going to be discussed in the meeting, right? If you come unprepared, you're just going to waste time and speak about things of no benefit. And at the end of the day, three, four hours go by and you didn't benefit anything. That's the consequence of not preparing. Ah, you have a job interview. You need to prepare. You get up early, best clothes. You get your papers and your documents. Everything is ready and you go. And may you just rock up. No one will look at you. You will fail. Even in matters of worship, we're supposed to prepare. Look at as salat Why was Wudu legislated before as salat and then adhan and repeat after mu'adhin, come to the masjid, pray a sunnah, and then pray the fard. See that preparation? That, this all is a preparation for the fard, so you can gain the maximum amount of reward in your fard. Otherwise, imagine the one who just comes to as salat and hadn't prepared for it. He's still running up the stairs. <sighs> Allah Akbar. And how is he going to earn al khushu' in his first rak'ah? Or second rak'ah, or maybe, be, maybe he'll catch something of al khushu' in his fourth rak'ah. So the idea is even in matters of worship, things were legislated before the fard, so that we prepare for the fard. Well, hajj, al hajj is a similar thing. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "What does a wadu? Pack up the bag. Pack up the bags. This is Allah's command for the one who's going to al hajj. What does a wadu? Pack up your bag. 
Take your belongings, take what you need, physical, whatever you need for your hajj, take it with you. Then he said, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ And the best thing you can pack up with you before you leave your hometown to go to Mecca is at taqwa Take at taqwa with you and go. That's the best thing you can have in preparation for al-hajj. Jibreel alayhi salam, when he comes to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he's still young and he cuts him up and opens his chest, takes his heart, washes it, takes out the evil trait from it, puts it back in. What's all this for? In preparation for the grand event of Al-Quran to come to him. Subhanallah. And in preparation as well, this was done once again in preparation for the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And even today, even today for our da'wah as well, a da'wah requires preparation. And I say this because there's so many people that think a da'wah is just something you can jump in all of a sudden. Hack, you wake up and you see a motivational video that tells you the reward and the virtue of a da'wah. Allah, tomorrow I want to be a da'i in Allah. That doesn't work like this. A da'wah requires preparation. You need to understand what you're going to preach to the people. You need to learn yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this about prophets. Look at the Prophet uh, Yahya alayhi salam. وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَالتَّوْرَاةَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ After that, وَرَسُولًا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ That he taught him التَّوْرَاةَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ وَالْحِكْمَةَ He taught him first. Then he became a prophet to Bani Israel. For preparation is very important. One of our biggest problems today is that we don't prepare for our worship. We prepare for everything else in life except for our worship. And then we come and we complain, why can't we connect with our worship? Anta, you did not prepare for it. Subhanallah, we just want to pray al-fard straight away. We want to get into Ramadan and fast straight away without any preparation. Well, you know, this is why Sha'ban is a big deal. Sha'ban is a big deal because it's one month before Ramadan. So think of it. It is a month of preparation. Well, this is why the deeds that we're going to do in Ramadan, which are what? Al-Quran, fasting, salat, the deeds that you do in Ramadan are the same deeds that are recommended in Sha'ban. This is a month, they used to call this month Shahrul Qurra. This is a month of Quran. And it's a month of fasting, month of salat, month of dua. Everything you're going to do in Ramadan, it is recommended to do now. But the difference is it's nafila here now. Fasting is a nafila. It prepares you. So that when you fast in this month and you pray and you're reading Quran, you come to Ramadan, you're just continuing. You don't have no headaches at the first, uh, first day of Ramadan because of fasting. Many people, they struggle in the first two, three days, still have a headache, I've got to adjust the routine. What are you doing? You're preparing for Ramadan in the first three days of Ramadan? That's supposed to be done now. Allah now. The idea, the idea of preparation is very important in our deen. Now, so how do we prepare for this blessed month of Ramadan? Firstly, let's discuss the right attitude. This is a new attitude you're supposed to add with you, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala, during these days in preparation for Ramadan. We have to have the right attitude. The attitude and the feeling of the fact that this could be your last Ramadan ever on earth. When you approach Ramadan with this attitude, and that is the case, it could be. Who among us is going to say that's not going to be the case? 100% everyone knows that this is the case and it could be, could be our last Ramadan. This is the attitude you're supposed to approach Ramadan with. When this feeling is inside of you, when this attitude is inside of you, you know what happens? It creates another feeling and another special attitude inside. And that is the attitude of urgency. You begin to panic and you feel that there's a sense of urgency within you to make the most of this month as much as possible because this could be the last time I live its days in my life. And this is why the companions, radiallahu anhum, when they were once with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listening to an advice from him, the Sahaba were there listening to an advice. And they said, ذَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونَ وَوَجِلَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبِ that the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was such that we began to tee, we began to cry. And our hearts began to tremble and shake. And they felt the intensity and the depth of the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they said, كَأَنَّهَا مَوْعِظَةُ مُوَدِّعٍ It was though it is, it's an advice from a fair willing person. Yani the gathering at that day, was so intense that they felt like these are the last words of Rasulullah to us. 
So you know what they said? They took advantage of the moment when they felt this might be the last time the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would talk to him, would talk to them. They said to him, Fa'usina, give us advice. When they felt this is the last moment we're going to meet, what happened? It gave them a panic, a sense of urgency. They took advantage of the moment and they said, Oh, Sina, give us more. Advise us, advise us. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was doing his first and last hajj and he felt that it might be the last time he sees his ummah and hajj, he gave them a khutbah that summarized everything he has been teaching since the beginning of his da'wah. That's why Hajjatul Wada' the khutbah of the farewell hajj practically combines everything in Islam that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught over 23 years. And during this khutbah, he said to them, Perhaps I will not have a chance to meet with you ever again after this month. When he felt that this was the farewell khutbah, when he felt that this was the last time to see his companions in hajj, he took advantage to remind the people. You see, when you have the feeling of this is the last time you experience something, heck from Allah Azza wa Jalla, it creates something within you that you take advantage of the moment. And this is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say to a companion when he advised him, إِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ When you get up to pray, فَصَلِّ صَلَاةَ مُوَدِّعَ Pray the prayer of a farewelling person. For imagine a person that is praying his final salat, Imagine, imagine a person now stands and prays and he knows this is his last salat on earth. The moment he makes a taslim, he is going to drop dead. How will his salat be? What kind of khushu' would be in his salat? What kind of honesty and sincerity is in this person's prayer? Do you think such a person would be distracted by worldly matters? And who messaged him? And what's on the outside world? And when he's going to collect his money? And when he's going to finish his job? You think he's going to think of this? He will think about nothing of this. None of this is going to be my concern. The moment I die, all of this is not my responsibility anymore. Those who come after me will look after my jobs and work and my money and my phone and all that. The majority of us, unfortunately, we fast Ramadan and the main concern is I just need to get my fard over and done with. Let's add a new dimension to our Ramadan and this is one of the first ways you're going to prepare with the right attitude. The fasting of a farewelling person. How is it going to be? Think that the first day of Ramadan, think that this is going to be the last first day of Ramadan you will ever see in your life. Allahu A'lam. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, no one is guaranteed the first day of Ramadan, let alone the second and the third and the end of it and another year. You live in dreams when you think, Wallah, next Ramadan I'll make the most of it. You live in a dream really. So when we worship Allah Azza wa Jal with this feeling and attitude that it's our last Ramadan, this bi'ibnillahi ta'ala would enhance your worship and it will convert this worship of Ramadan from being a habit to being an actual worship that you want Allah Azza wa Jal's pleasure from. The practical matters in terms of how we are going to prepare for this blessed month of Ramadan. Number one, bitawbati wal istighfar with seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness and repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no doubt, this is one of the main matters in terms of preparing for Ramadan. Ask Allah Azza for forgiveness of the past sins, the major and the minor, the intentional and the accidental mistakes. Ask Allah Azza to forgive you from all of that. And ask Him to forgive you from the shortcomings of your worship. This is a dhamb as well. The shortcomings in our worship is a dhamb. We ask Allah Azza to forgive you from the sickness of the heart. Whether it's jealousy or hypocrisy or arrogance or hatred, whatever it is, there's so much to ask Allah Azza wa to forgive you from. You don't know which sin blocks you from the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's what sins are. They are a block. They are big boulders that stand between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment they're crushed and removed, you find that you're on a highway with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rushing in your worship and uh, in seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. The most successful people in Ramadan are those who enter Ramadan having repented from all their sins. And the greatest word that can come out of your mouth with a sincere heart is Astaghfirullah. Wallahi. If Astaghfirullah was uttered once, 
coming from a sincere, honest heart, Wallahi, it is enough to destroy a history of bad deeds between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is enough. For imagine a person that is repeating al-istighfar and taking advantage of the blessed times and times that were meant for istighfar, like just before Salat al-Fajr, half an hour, istighfar, nothing else. Half an hour before Salat al-Fajr, every day, from now to Ramadan. Nothing, just istighfar. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَالْمُسْتَغْفِرِينَ بِالْأَسْحَارِ Allah Azza wa Jal praised people that would seek His forgiveness at this time. At a time where everything is quiet and peaceful and you have no distractions in life. No one is calling at this time. No work at this time. Children are sleeping at this time. There is no one. When you get up and you're seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness, that can only refer to one thing and that is that you are sincere. That you really wanted Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness. Of course, there's a difference between doing istighfar now and doing istighfar just before Fajr. The one who does before Fajr, this is more of an honest and sincere time. This is more of a time in where a person is actually saying, Oh Allah, I got up and I don't have any worldly distraction, but I'm here just for al-istighfar. And they're more in a position for Allah Azza wa Jal to accept his forgiveness. Seek Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness in abundance. During the day and during the night, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make istighfar more than a hundred times. Allah Azza wa Jal loves those who seek his forgiveness. He loves them. Inna Allah yuhibbu tawwabin. And if Allah Azza wa Jal loves them, He will forgive them and He will allow them to enter the doors of His mercy that will open up in Ramadan bi ta'ala. And as we said, the biggest barrier between us and Allah and the forgiveness of Allah and the mercy of Allah is our sins. The moment we put effort to remove them through al istighfar, the doors would open. When you seek istighfar, al malaika are making dua for you. Allah Azza wa Jal He says in the Quran that the angels say, رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا The angels ask Allah to forgive those who repent. Say you want more than this? An angel will make dua for you if you are to continuously make tawbah and istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ وَقِهِمْ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, it is a must that every breath the slave takes in and out, yani into you breathe in and out, with every breath that goes in, a person should praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every breath that comes out, a person should seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. But into you're supposed to be between these two things, between alhamdulillah azza wa jal, وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارُ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِسْتِغْفَارُ اللَّهِ وَحَمْدُ اللَّهِ These are the two moments of your life. Every salat you do and every worship you do, this is Alhamdulillah Azza wa Jal. And at the same time, when you do these worships and seek Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness during these worships, that is Al-Istighfar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولُ لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهُ تَوَّابًا رَّحِيمًا Allah Azza wa Jal said, and if when the people wrong themselves, when they wrong themselves, had they come to you, O Rasul Allah, and asked you to ask Allah to forgive them, and if they were to ask Allah Azza wa Jal for forgiveness, لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَّحِيمًا They would have found Allah Yani accepting of their repentance and merciful. They would have found Allah. The one who seeks forgiveness would find Allah. He would find the mercy of Allah. He would find the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal in his life. For that's the first matter in how we are going to prepare for this blessed month. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the second is to reconcile with your brothers and your sisters that you have boycotted and cut ties with. Especially your family relatives. Muslims should not be boycotting Muslims. This is the general statement that we say. Why? Because the one who boycotts his brother in Islam or sister in Islam, they are deprived of Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness. As in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the doors of the paradise are open every Monday and Thursday. And Allah Azza wa Jal forgives all his servants except for a disbeliever, a mushrik, and for two people that have enmity towards each other. He says to the angels, Anviru Hadain, delay these two. 
And he says it three times. Delay these two. Delay their records. We're not going to accept anything from them. We will not forgive them until they reconcile between each other. Problem. This is a problem. Because the grand gift in Ramadan is forgiveness. Man saw Ramadan. إيمان واحد غفر له ما تقدم من ذنب من قام رمضان إيمان غفر له ما تقدم من ذنب من قام ليلة القدر غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه the grand prize in Ramadan is forgiveness of sins وهي the hadith is saying the one who has a problem and there's boycott between him and his Muslim brothers or sisters is deprived of forgiveness for this is a big problem and this is why Ibn Mas'ud رضي الله عنه when he was asked how did you people prepare for Ramadan Ibn Mas'ud answered this question. He said, مَا كَانَ أَحَدٌ يَجْرَأُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَسْتَقْبِلَ الْهِلَالِ وَفِي قَلْبِهِ ذَرَّةُ حِقْدٍ عَلَىٰ أَخِيهِ He said, none of us, هذا الصحابة, they said we would prepare for Ramadan with the fact that none of us would dare to hold an atom's weight of hatred or animosity or jealousy towards each other. We wouldn't dare to do this. Then we know the severity of this. It deprives us of Allah's forgiveness. Subhanallah. For this is something that you need to work on. As for يعني, different and certain cases, and someone has a case, and that's different. And I'm speaking to you in general terms. That if there's a boycott, ya khi, go to your brother in Islam and say to him, I've repented to Allah. I hope you have repented. Let's mend our relationship for the sake of Allah. Between us there is la ilaha illallah, the bond of iman. If I have wronged you in any way, please forgive me. And if you have wronged me, I have forgiven you for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we do this in the intention of preparing for this blessed month, right? For this is something that يعني, it's important for everyone to look after. The third matter in how we prepare for Ramadan is bid-du'a. The companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was salaf. They used to make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, six months before Ramadan. Look, now, now we're speaking about Ramadan two weeks before Ramadan. A person should be making dua long before this. That Allah Azza wa Jal allow him to reach Ramadan and benefit from it. That is their preparation. And you know, whoever has a great concern for something, he's always asking and making dua for it. Let's say someone was sick and he's really concerned for his sickness. Wallah, well, he's making dua day and night. If you had a relative that is sick, you're making dua and you're asking others to make dua for him as well, please. If someone has caught or has something huge in his life or facing a calamity, you reach out to others, please make dua for me. You make dua for yourself. You're intense in your dua. When something is of great concern for you, you make dua. For the sign that Ramadan is a great concern for you would be through your dua. And understand that you cannot achieve anything in life. And you can let alone worship Allah if Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't give you the strength and the ability to do so. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, مَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ حَسَنَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Any good deed that you do, it came from Allah Azza wa Jal. Even make dua to Allah that he give you the ability to worship him. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says about the believers when they enter the paradise. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانَا لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِي لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ they enter the paradise, the believers, and they will say, Alhamdulillah, all praise is for Allah, the one who guided us to this, to this paradise. And we, ha we would have never ever been guided had it not been for the guidance of Allah for us. Heather, in the paradise, we're going to acknowledge that no way we could have been here without Allah's guidance to us. You understand why? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim is 17 times a day, at least. Hatta dawah that we do. Heather, I'm speaking to you now. It can only happen by Allah's permission. As Allah Azza wa says to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, بِإِذْنِهِ By Allah's permission, you are to call the people to Al-Islam and to good. Went to now, sitting in Al-Masjid, coming to Al-Masjid, listening to Dhikrullah, and then attending As-Salawat, that you think this came by your effort? Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, فِي بُيُوتٍ آذِنَ اللَّهِ أَن تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا small. These are houses in which Allah gave permission that people come and establish his dhikr inside these houses. This is the theme in our life. This is the central message in our life. is our purpose. You alone we're going to worship. That's our purpose in life. But what's the means? How are we going to fulfill this worship? Is the means. That's the key to reaching this purpose. We're going to seek your help. 
So, Iyaka na'bud, we're going to worship you. How are we going to do that? Wa Iyaka rasta'in. We're going to always seek your help. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would teach the companions after your salat, say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husn ibadatik. Oh Allah, give me the ability and the power and the strength. Oh Allah, aid me and support me that I remain grateful to you and that I remain yani, in consistent worship and perfect my worship for you. Now, وَحَتَّى النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ In his dua, he used to say, اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْأَلُكَ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ Oh Allah, I ask you that you grant me the ability to do good. If the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could do good on his own, why would he ask Allah to give him the ability to do so? For he teaches us that without asking Allah to give you the ability to worship, you will not be able to worship. Very simple. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Anyone who finds himself doing good, he should praise Allah. Why? Because it was Allah who gave you the strength to do the good. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكْ فَلَا يُلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ And if you find yourself doing other than good, doing evil, doing haram, then don't blame anyone but yourself. Huh? See that? Subhanallah. Because people often flip it around. People, if they're not careful, and arrogance takes over them, whenever they do good, they want to ascribe it to themselves. Anna, I achieved such and such, and I did such and such. <laughs> when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, فَلْيَحْمَدِ And then when people do bad, they want to try to blame it on someone else. Oh, that was the shaytan. It was him. He's the one who dragged me to it. He offered me. He called me, and I went to his house, and well, I found the shisha then. Yani, yalla. He invited me to it. It wasn't like, I did it from my own will. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying anyone who did Al-Haram, فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ Blame yourself. Acknowledge it that you did this with your own hands. I see, the attitude needs to change. Every good is from Allah Azza wa Jal. So if, you, if you're if you planning on doing good in Ramadan, stop. You cannot do any good except by his permission and his help. So turn and ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the ability to do that good. Fourth way of how we prepare for this blessed month of Ramadan is by learning about its virtues and reward. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this is how mankind is. This is how humans are. When we know the reward of an action we do, we get motivated and inspired. In worldly matters and in religious matters. I say to your brother, come cut the grass. I give you $500. Bismillah. I'll cut the grass. I know what the reward is. Everyone goes to work. Because there's a pay at the end of the week. You're looking forward to it. There's a reward. It motivates you, right? Alongside the other qualities you're supposed to have of honesty and integrity in your work, you're motivated. When there's an increase, when there's a pay rise, huh? there's more effort. Like Ramadan is a month of pay rise. Hasanat are multiplied. The goodness is multiplied. Al khair is open. Tayyib, it should motivate more. But how can you be motivated if you don't know the reward of Ramadan? Shift the problem. When you lose motivation, you need to turn back to the books of a hadith that discuss the reward and the merit of the virtue of Ramadan. Hack the human being, that's how he is. Most of the Quran and the ahadith about virtues, virtues, virtues. What reward you get for this worship and what you get for that. And we find encouragement in this. Tayyip, you need to understand. What's the biggest reward you get for fasting Ramadan? The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَطْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ Every single fasting of the year is only voluntary. Whether it's Ashura, whether it's uh, Arafah, whatever it is, all of it is voluntary. The only obligatory month and days to fast is Ramadan. It doesn't come all the time, it comes once a month only, once a year. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, there is nothing that brings the servant closer to Allah more than him doing that which Allah prescribed and obligated upon him. The most beloved thing which will bring the slave closer to Allah is that which Allah made obligatory upon him. That's the biggest gift. Every single day you fast of Ramadan, the biggest thing you are earning is Al-Qurba min Allah. You are being drawing nearer and nearer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Kalla la tuti'ahu wasjud. Waqtarib. Come close to Allah. How do you come close to Allah? By fulfilling the obligations. 
Ramadan fasting is the biggest deed that a person does that is continuous non-stop. You fast how many hours? 12 hours? 13 hours? Can you read the Quran for 13 hours non-stop? Can you pray for 13 hours non-stop? Can you make dua for 13 hours non-stop? You can't. No one can do it. Amma fasting, the most continuous, longest worship that you remain in worship from the beginning to the end. The majority of the month is going to be spent in fasting and obligation. Then how close is this going to bring a person to Allah Azza wa Jal? This is a reward. Al Qurba min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says, Lissaimi farhatan, farhatun inda fitrihi wa farhatun inda liqa'i rabbihi. For the fasting person, there are two moments of joy. There is a physical enjoyment and there is spiritual enjoyment. The physical enjoyment is, of course, when it's time for iftar. Now that you're able to indulge in food and drink and sexual relations after having given all this up the entire day. Abu Rajab rahimahullah, he said something very important. He says the physical enjoyment is only achieved if you break your fast upon that which is permissible. If you break your fast upon something haram, like a cigarette or haram food, then such a person is deprived of the physical joy that he has at the end of the day. And there is another type of joy and that is a spiritual enjoyment. And that is when he meets Allah Azza wa Jal. There will be a joy for the believers when they meet Allah Azza wa Jal. Firstly, because he's meeting his creator. And every deed he did, he did for this creator. Now there is a joy to meet who is Allah, the one I did all my worship for. And secondly, there is a joy to meet Allah because you want to meet the huge reward that he has prepared for you on that day. This is like a day of graduation. And you know the day of graduation, students are excited, especially those who did good and prepared and worked hard. They are excited on the day of graduation to see what reward and what result they have. For here, the day of judgment, a day of graduation for the believers. So no doubt, on the day of judgment, farhatun عِنْدَ لِقَاءِ رَبِّهِ They are happy to meet Allah to see what reward has He set aside for them. And we learn from this that fasting prepares a person for the meeting with Allah. You see, Musa alayhi salam, when Allah azza wa jal met with him on the mountain, he commanded him to fast 40 nights. Who 40 nights? يعني 40 ليلة. أتم ميقات ربيه 40 ليلة. Meaning he fasted the nights, and it's obvious that you have to fast the days. So he fasted 40 day and night. Non-stop. In preparation to meet Allah. Then he was in a position to meet Allah and Allah Azza wa spoke to him. Fasting prepares you to meet for Allah to, to meet Allah Azza wa This is why fundamentally we are supposed to be fasting every day of our life. You know that? Every single day of our life we are supposed to fast. If you're serious about meeting Allah and entering the paradise. For this is why, يعني, you know, you reflect over the story of Adam alayhi salam. In the paradise, what was his sin? That they ate ate from the tree what got us down to earth something related to food that's what got us down to earth so if you want to go back what's the first condition of repentance leave the sin leave the food fast fast 30 days and then the one who does six days of shawwal it's as though he's fasted the idan you do ramadan and six days as though you have fasted every single day of the year. Imagine this. Such a person now is ready to meet Allah because he has earned the reward of fasting every single day in his life. And then you need to understand this meaning. This meaning. Well, fasting, it cleans the heart. It polishes it. It scrubs the heart. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, fasting three days of every month, tudhibu wahar al-sadr. It removes the evil traits of the heart. Fasting three days of every month removes the evil traits of the heart. Arrogance and jealousy and whatever it is that a person does. For imagine 30 days of fasting, obligatory fasting. And the heart's being polished and scrubbed. It comes out crystal, shining. And when it's shining, خلاص, a person is ready to meet Allah. Because what's the most beneficial thing you're going to meet Allah with? Didn't Allah Azza wa Jal say, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ On a day in which your wealth and your children will be of no benefit? 
إذا what will benefit إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم except for a person who comes with a heart that is سليم what does سليم mean سليم قلب سليم means a heart that is clean a heart that is clean you know the heart Allah gave you when you were first born come with that kind of heart on the day of judgment I gave it to you fresh and clean there was no sin on it there was no marking on it there was no blackness on it when you first when you were first born that's a قلب سليم that's a clean heart. So come back with a qalb salim. Like I gave it to you. This is why a lot of the rewards yeah, about the hajj as though a newborn. هذا قلب salim. القلب salim is the heart that is cleaned from sins and bid'ah and major and minor shirk. It's clean from all of this. Ramadan, fasting, is an opportunity to polish this heart. For when your qalb is salim, it's going to benefit you on the day of judgment as Allah said. It will benefit you on the day of judgment. And you earn that paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the fifth way of how to prepare for the blessed month of Ramadan is to understand uh, how to fast correctly. How can you come to Ramadan and not understand how to fast correctly? The main pillar in Ramadan is to fast. Therefore, it only makes sense that you learn how to fast correctly. You know, the purpose of fasting. What's the purpose of fasting? By in fasting you avoid food and drink and sexual relations. But the purpose is to nurture a taqwa within us. That's the purpose of fasting. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain a taqwa. Fasting is supposed to nurture a taqwa. What is a taqwa? It's basic, very simple. A taqwa is for you to keep away from sins, decrease your sins, and increase your hasanat. هذا taqwa. At taqwa is to do what Allah commanded and to keep away from that which Allah prohibited. This is at taqwa. And so this is what fasting is for. That's the purpose of fasting. It increases your hasanat and it keeps you away from the haram. Because the fasting person is more conscious and aware. He doesn't do what's haram. He avoids the halal. When you're fasting and I put you in a room alone, no one is there and there's an apple in front of you. You won't eat it even though an apple is, is halal in Islam. You won't eat it. Why? Ya akhi, it's an apple. It's halal. Why wouldn't you eat it? Because you know Allah is watching. MashaAllah. That's the kind of attitude you're supposed to have with everything else during your life. You did not eat it because you knew Allah is watching. Tayyib, so now when it comes to haram matters, isn't Allah watching as well? Tayyib, after Ramadan, isn't Allah watching as well? Huh? Then Ramadan and fasting develops this taqwa and nurtures it. And you're doing this for 30 days. So you're being nurtured and nourished with this taqwa. What Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, fasting is two parts. Hatta Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, fasting is two things. That's what you need to learn. That's how you fast correctly. Two things. Listen, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, there is the fasting of the stomach from food and drink, and there is fasting of the limbs from sin and transgression. Well, Salaf rahimahullah, used to say that fasting the easiest type of fasting is to refrain from food, drink, and sexual relation. Had the easy fasting. And he said, the real fasting is to abstain from all forms of sin and transgression. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this to us, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in addition to teaching us that we are to keep away from food, drink, and sexual relations, he also said there are three things you're supposed to keep away from. And you know that? When you keep away from these three things, and these three physical things, you have now fasted correctly. In a hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, مَن لَمْ يَدَعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ وَالْجَهَلِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ أَنْ يَدَعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Whoever doesn't give up, alongside food, drink, and sexual relations, three more other things, they are, قَوْلَ الزُّورِ False speech, huh, even swearing and telling lies, and backbiting, and gossip, and all foul language that comes from the mouth. Add this to food, drink, and sexual relations. Add it. That's one thing. And Nabi Wasallam says, whoever doesn't leave these things. So you need to fast from these things. Qawl az-zur. Az-zur is a comprehensive term that refers to anything that is falsehood. Wal-amala bih. And evil deeds. Evil deeds. Yani the evil deeds. So that means the fasting of the eye. That's a deed. When you look at something haram, that must the eyes must fast with you. 
The hand when it does something haram, it should fast with you as well. And your hands and your feet and everything. Give it all up. A taqwa is supposed to be flowing in your entire body and your veins. Everything is supposed to keep away from al haram. That's the second thing. Hada is fasting. Limbs supposed to fast. Wal jahl. You also are supposed to refrain from jahl. What's jahl? Jahl is two things. Number one, jahl is ignorance. What is ignorance? Ignorance is when you know something and you do not implement it. And when I know a salat is obligatory and I don't pray, that's ignorance. That you knew there's salat and you didn't pray. When I know the fire burns and I put my hand in there, I'm ignorant. You had knowledge. Why didn't you act upon your knowledge? And then there's a problem there. And that's jahl. So you need to keep away from jahl. And the other meaning to jahl is the foolish, arrogant character and behavior. The, the bad attitude, the bad character, that's jahl as well. So if someone wants to argue with you during Ramadan or swear at you and insult you, don't raise your voice. Don't fight with anyone. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يصخب. Don't fight with anyone. Don't raise your voice at anyone. That's what I يصخب. Rather, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us what to do. If someone is going to insult and angry and raise his voice at you and so on, say to them, إِنِّي صَائِمْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ Two times and walk away. I'm fasting. Yani, what does it mean? In context, it means, yeah, I'm fasting. And I cannot raise my voice on you and swear back at you and insult you because that's another type of fasting I'm supposed to do alongside food, drink, and sexual relations. And keep your fasting protected. Purify your fasting. Keep it intact and move away. Now, if a person does this, now he has fasted correctly. Don't forget this meaning. This is just as important as leaving food, drink, and, 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 and sexual relations. Remember, at the end of the day, the purpose of Ramadan is not to starve you and to deprive you from sexual relations. The purpose of Ramadan was to nurture taqwa. What taqwa is what will protect this and protect your limbs from al-haram and protect you from ignorance and bad character. That's what taqwa would do. And that's the purpose. As, as for يعني, speaking in terms of from a fiqh perspective, if a person was to refrain from food, drink, and sexual relations, and then yes, he backbit someone, he slandered someone, he did a bad deed with his eyes, hmm? and he يعني, swore at others. From a fiqh perspective, his fasting is still correct, and he doesn't have to make up that day. But he lost a lot of reward. Fasting, if it's not correct, the more you destroy your fasting, the less reward you earn. It's like a salat. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that a person finishes his salat, وَمَا كُتِبَ لَهُ إِلَّا عُشْرُهَا تُسْعُهَا ثُمْنُهَا سُبْعُهَا سُدْسُهَا خُمْسُهَا رُبْعُهَا ثُلْثُهَا نِصْفُهَا The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that a person might pray. And he will leave. He will end his salat having earned a tenth of the reward. Look, there, there was an opportunity to earn one whole reward, a big reward. But some people earn a tenth. Some a ninth. Hmm? Some an eighth. Some a seventh. Some sixth. Some they earn a fifth. Some they earn a quarter. Huh? Some earn a third. Huh? Or some earn a half. And some earn complete reward. Allahu alam. Fasting is like this. The more perfect your fasting the more reward there is. Allah, you didn't control your tongue. Your limbs weren't controlling. And it's going to re reduce, reduce, reduce. Nah, until you fasted a whole day and you earned at the end of it maybe a tenth. Why would you يعني, waste this opportunity upon yourself? When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said this fact, Perhaps that a fasting person doesn't earn anything from his fasting except hunger. What does that mean? Yeah, and he doesn't earn any reward. The only thing he earned was that he went a day, starved himself. That's it. And perhaps it could be that a person prays the whole night and doesn't earn anything. No reward, none, nothing. Only tiredness. Heather, he went, oh, he better find him to sleep. So you need to understand, alongside your worship, your character must develop as well. Character. And first and foremost, your character with Allah. He says something is haram, keep away from it. And then behave with the people. That's how you keep your fasting pure and intact. Now, طيب. Uh, and you know, subhanAllah, people are always just focused on the physical things. Keep away from food, drink, sexual relations. خلاص. And he thinks he's good. He's alright. 
And we know this from the question of the people. Uh, if I hack a, a spray in my nose, does it break my fast? If accidentally a drop of water, do I break my fast? Now, if accidentally I did this, what about if I swam? See, the questions are all about the physical part. No one ever asks, if I was to swear, does it break my fast? No one seeks that kind of knowledge. Even the ideas, people are ignorant. That this is supposed to, is the purpose of this. Fasting is nurturing this. A taqwa, to protect this, to save it, yeah. And the limbs and uh, the ignorance, as we said. Sixth way to prepare for this month of Ramadan, yeah, mentally, psychologically. Allah Azza wa when he referred to Ramadan, he said, Ayyaman ma'dudat. Just a few days. Even always remind yourself, Ramadan is just a few days. These few days make up what? The next day was Shahru Ramadan. These few days make up a month. But look at the, the attitude when I say a month. Actually, oh, a month, a twelfth of the year. It's big. But if I say a Yemen ma'dudat, just a few days, it sounds really quick. So the, 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 the sense of panic and urgency is created within the heart once again. And it's just a few days and it's gone. It's like a, a, a short sale and it finishes. Hurry up before the sale ends. That, that kind of idea. A Yemen ma'dudat. So it's simple, it's easy. We start, all of a sudden, 10 days are over. All of a sudden, we're in the last 10 nights. All of a sudden, Al-Eid. Oh, ya Allah. Whoever did the most, Alhamdulillah. And who didn't? Qaddar Allahu ma sha'a fa'alu. Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi raji'un. It would be a calamity. For don't be lazy. Push yourself. The doors of the paradise are open. Allah is freeing people from the fire. And a few days, and all this is over. Spend the nights with the Qur'an. Bi dhikrillahi azza wa jal. With dua, with charity during the day. Wal Qur'an, avoid the haram. And it's only a few days. Show Allah Azza wa Jal that you really appreciate that He has given you life until you witness Ramadan. Show gratitude to Allah. How are you going to thank Allah if He was to give you life to Ramadan? How do you intend to thank Allah? Do you have a plan in how you're going to thank Allah Azza wa Jal? Wallah, is it just the usual? Come back from work and sit on the couch, lazy, hand in the phone all day, carelessly strolling away from post to post, from real to real? Something music, something Quran, something da'wah, something a woman, some. Kay, Father, how are you going to spend Ramadan like this? Father, this is the Ramadan of the foolish people, Ramadan of the ignorant, Ramadan of those who did not see and acknowledge Allah's blessing upon them. For, Anna, my advice, shut down your social media, except to that which will benefit you and keep you motivated and inspired, at least for this month. At least for this month, shut it down altogether. There's nothing on it. Trust me, there's nothing on it. Wallahi, there's nothing. It's just the hype that the world has made that everyone's on it. Otherwise, in reality, what benefit has it brought in your life? If anything, it's wasted your time. When they, if you sit with yourself and hold yourself accountable, uh, if you're humble enough, you'll acknowledge that it has only wasted your time. Go and sit with people that have never opened a social media account in their life. See what they do. See then what you're missing out on. That's the real life. Is away from all this. For at least, at least for Ramadan, keep away. Except as I said, if you need it because there's something beneficial or there's an episode and you know that it's planned to be aired in Ramadan, then خلاص, go in for that and come out. Because that's from the goodness that you can do in Ramadan. Other than that, turn away from all these things. The seventh thing in how we prepare for this blessed month of Ramadan, we prepare by thinking good of Allah Azza wa Jal. Husnul dhanni billah. Don't enter this month with a negative thought in Allah that He won't forgive you and that ana this and that and ana I cannot have يعني, any chance. I don't stand a chance before Allah. Wallahi, ana before I arrived here, I sat with someone uh, يعني, where I was overseas. And يعني, I wanted to interview such a person on a certain matter. And I said to them, what's your thought of Allah Azza wa Jal? Wallahi, their word was to say, I believe Allah is going to throw me in hell. Why would you have this idea about Allah? And we had a discussion, a very long discussion. But why is there people that exist that think like this about Allah? Because what do you think is what do you get? For enter Ramadan and always in your life have positive good thought in Allah Azza wa Jal. That he will forgive you. That he will free your neck from the fire. 
The one who has good thought in Allah, Allah is more generous for him to shock you on the day of judgment and give you other than what you thought in him. That Allah does not play tricks with the servants. And they are thinking good all your life of Allah. And then you think you come on the day of judgment. And Allah will play a trick with you and throw you in your jahannam. Ma'ad Allah for the one who thinks like this about Allah. Think good of Allah, positive of Allah, and do the work. Because the only one that is thinking good of Allah is the one who's putting effort. You do put your effort with tawbah ila Allah, wal istighfar, then think good of Allah. Don't confuse that good thought in Allah and you're doing nothing. La. Worry for yourself. Worry for yourself. Be careful. If you're going to do nothing and just rely on good thought, worry about yourself. And may you put effort with dua, with ibadah. After that comes the good. This is where good thought is supposed to be. That's the correct positioning of good thought. After effort that comes from you. Now, thinking good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal is able. Now, why do you think negative of Allah? When you think negative of Allah, as though you're saying Allah is unable to forgive me. Sure. This is a huge statement. You ascribed inability to Allah azza wa jal. How that could be on the border. Lines of kufr. Allah azza wa jal qadir. Look at the magicians of Fir'aun. Practicing magic or shirk all their life. When they saw the truth in front of them, they fell into sujood. One sajda wiped away an entire history of shirk and sayyat. For what kind of forgiveness would Allah azza wa jal give a person who worshipped him for 30 days and hoping for his mercy and forgiveness? On one sajda. Everything was forgiven. 30 days. Yani this is a big deal. For don't allow the shaytan to convince you otherwise. Now, Adhan Abu Jamil. Yalla, Adhan will finish. We'll, we'll wrap up after the Adhan, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. My brothers and sisters in Islam, and the final matter in how a person prepares for this month is to increase his knowledge about Ramadan. Learn about the sunnah of al-suhoor, wal-iftar, what is supposed to be said, what is supposed to be done, and understand as well what to eat when you break your fast. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to break his fast, he used to break his fast ala rutab, which is the moist, wet dates, al-rutab. In wajadaha, if it was available in his house. See this word, in wajadaha, if it was available, what does it teach you? And it teaches me something. Because the next part of the hadith says, فَإِلَّمْ يَجِدْهَا فَعَلَى تَمَرَاتِ فَإِلَّمْ يَجِدْ فَعَلَى حَسَوَاتٍ مِنْ مَاءِ If he did not find rutab, then he would look for tamar, which is the dry day. And if he does not find that, he would sip a few sips of water. What I learned from this is that Contrary to what people to do, do today, when Ramadan is coming, ya Allah, the boxes of dates are being purchased and stacked in the house. Yani as though you guaranteed you for yourself a date every day. Tabu Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fa'illam yajid. If he did not find the dates in his house, meaning he didn't stack dates before Ramadan in his house, fa let the matter run smooth and normal. What you have in your house of dates now, you have. Eat it, right? Then when it finishes, go and buy more. And, yeah, and like this. Amma this kind of preparation that people have before, purchase this and in bulk and kaza. How did it do if you? I know I was going to say it's haram. It's not a matter of haram and halal. But it's all right. If you did not find a date in your house to eat, it's all right. This happened to the best of this nation. This happened to the teacher who taught us. Right? Faith, there's no bismillah, water. Don't busy yourself with uh, bulk buying and moving from place to place. I don't find dates here. He went to another shop. No dates from there for another one. But I don't know how to, hours and hours go by and he's driving his car looking for dates. Also learn a sunnah of at-tarawih and praying with the imam. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us that praying at-tarawih every night of Ramadan is a reason for why all the sins are forgiven. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also teaches us another reward for praying at tarawih In a hadith he says, Ya arajulun min quda'ata. From the tribe of Quda'a, a man came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to him, In shahidtu an la ilaha illallahu annaka rasulullah. He's asking him, saying, Ya Rasulullah, if I was to testify 
that there is no Lord worthy of worship except Allah and that you are the messenger of Allah. وصليت الصلوات الخمس and I prayed the five daily prayers وصمت رمضان وقمته and I fast Ramadan and I pray its nights وأتيت الزكاة and I gave a zakat so النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said من مات على هذا كان من الصديقين والشهداء whoever dies upon this testifying that there is no Lord worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Praying five daily prayers. Fasting Ramadan. Praying its nights. Giving zakat. If he dies while having done this during his life, he dies earning the rank of as-siddiqeen, which is straight after the prophets. The rank of as-siddiqeen is straight after al-anbiya. And he earns the rank of as-shuhada. Subhanallah. See, the, 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 the unique thing in this hadith, that wasn't obligatory, Everything else was obligatory, it was praying its nights. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever prays with the imam until the imam leaves, as though he has prayed an entire night. Allahu Akbar. You pray with the imam one hour, what is it? Half an hour, 40 minutes, and then you spend the rest of the night sleeping, but you earn the reward as though you prayed that whole time, even the time you were sleeping. And what is meant by until the imam leaves, Yani until he makes taslim from Salat al Witr. When he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, from Salat al Witr, then you have be prayed until the Imam leaves. Well, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he used to pray with the Imam and he would not leave until the Imam leaves. He used to leave with the Imam. So that's the first thing. If you're able to pray and sit and leave with the Imam, that's the ideal option. But if the Imam has a habit, of sitting and sits for a long time after a salat then it's fine to leave, no problems. And if a masjid has two imams, let's say, two imams, so how do you do, fulfill this sunnah? You wait until both of them finish. And if you want to pray extra at night, it is fine that you get up in the last rak'ah of al-witr and make it odd, uh, you make it even. So if the last rak'ah is witr one, you make it even, that's two, and then you're allowed to pray after that whatever you want during the night, but you do not repeat the witr again. But the ideal situation is to pray with the imam and pray witr with him and finish al-witr with him. And if you want to pray after that, you're allowed to pray, no problems. And you don't have to repeat al-witr because you've already prayed it. Now, wallahu a'lam. Fa, you learn the sunan, you learn that charity is something recommended in Ramadan when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be the most generous of people. Especially in Ramadan, he was the most generous with good. Not just money. يعني كان أجود الناس بالخير. An advice with people. Teach someone something. صدقة. Clothe someone. Feed someone. Pay the debt of someone. Do something good. هذا what it means to be generous in Ramadan. And he used to be most generous in Ramadan. You know why? هلك والحديث says حين يلقاه جبريل فيدارسه القرآن. He used to be most generous, especially when Jibreel used to come recite the Qur'an to him. Why? I'll tell you why. Because when a person reads the Qur'an, his heart is drawing nearer and nearer to Allah and the afterlife. So therefore, it's withdrawing from this worldly life. So he gives, and he's detaching from the worldly life. See the effect, the true effect of the Quran in your life, as you draw nearer to the hereafter, you're being detached from the afterlife. What is it? What, you're being detached from this life. What's a sign? You're detaching from this life and its luxuries, the extra giving, the extra generosity. And, and, and his generosity was described as Ajwadu bil khayri min al mursala. He was more generous than the strong, violent wind. What does that mean? You know, a strong, violent wind. It does not leave anything in its path except it touches. A wind, when it blows in a city, it affects the trees. It touches the leaves, the houses, the windows of houses, the doors, the streets, the cars, the people, everything in its path it touches. For this is what is meant by a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being more generous than an uncontrollable wind. Meaning his generosity would get everyone. 
It would reach everyone. The poor and the rich and the Sahabi were the one that's struggling with the in the masjid or outside with women with children. Everyone would say, take something of the generosity and the goodness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For remember, the charity in Ramadan has a huge deal and it should be a big thing in the life of a Muslim during Ramadan. Ger generosity needs to increase. Feed those who don't have anything to eat. And mashallah, there's a lot of campaigns, a lot of يعني, charity organizations that uh, organize this on your behalf. All that is required from you is to take this money and to pay it. And behind your money is your effort and your sweat and your work. For when you're donating, it's not just money. You donated hours and hours of work. You donated from your life, from your time. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, you feel this, you internalize it so that you understand the reward will be great. This is not something that will go easy in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You give the, and, and make sure you feed a family throughout Ramadan. Make sure at least for every single day of Ramadan, at least you're feeding a family or you're feeding someone that is poor, right? This is extra generosity in Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability that we worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala during our lives and more so in Ramadan. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend our lives until we witness this Ramadan and many Ramadans after this. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to forgive our shortcomings. Inna huwa liyu thalika wal qadiru alayhi wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.